hello everyone thank you so much thank you david for giving us the floor and thank you professor for your nice presentation uh, so today here i'm reshma hog with my colleague anzo and ahmed today we are going to talk about the today we are going to discuss about china versus united states how capitalism undermines globalization by benjamin burbaume sorry for my wrong pronunciation so yeah the, this is our overall contents uh, we are going to introduce our introduce this paper by a small summary then we'll talk about the some strengths of the paper and my colleagues will discuss uh, broadly in the discussion part and lastly we have some open questions so here the summary of the paper um, basically the paper examines the developing competition between china and the us in the framework of uh, global capitalism uh, it argues that while china's growth as a capitalist power uh, it is now paradoxically uh, affecting globalization itself uh, the key reason for this uh, dispute is China's transition from a subordinate uh, participant in the global economy to a direct competitor um, with the US, particularly in technologically advanced areas. Uh, initially, the US benefited from China's cheap labor, uh, also large, uh, large scale production capabilities, but now China has become a major uh, a technological and economic force uh, it now seeks to reshape the global economic order in ways that challenges u.s uh, dominance uh, a central uh, theme of this paper i found which is like infrastructure um, uh, as a strategic asset where So the paper provides a fresh viewpoint by arguing that China's capitalist rise paradoxically uh, undermines the globalization process that once facilitated it. Uh, this challenges conventional narratives about uh, the harmonious relationship between capitalism and globalization. Uh, uh, I. Uh, so I have found that uh, in this paper, uh, the paper focus on infrastructure uh, by focusing on infrastructure like uh, our belt and road initiative, digital infrastructure. Uh, the paper introduces a critical concept of structural power, uh, showing how um, infrastructure battles between China and US play a uh, decisive role in shaping uh, global economic and geopolitical economics. Also in this paper, there is a comprehensive framework. Uh, uh, the paper combines the insights from politi uh, international political economy and geopolitics, uh, showing how economic interests and political strategies are deeply interconnected in the US-China uh, conflict, particularly in trade, um, technology, and infrastructure. Lastly, I found um, China, US, uh, China and US rivalry is very interesting. Uh, the paper goes beyond surface level explanations, uh, offering a multi-dimensional analysis how economic competition between US and China, especially in technology and global markets, contributes to the uh, broader geopolitical struggle. Uh, it illustrates how both nations seek to reshape global rules uh, to their advantage. Now, my colleague Enzo will discuss, uh, we'll start our discussion. Yeah. Uh 
thank you for the opportunity of being here and talking a bit about your paper. Um, I'm going to be a bit less nice than Heshma because we were demanded to do to open some discussion about it. So I brought here an excerpt of the um, of the paper uh, in which I outlined some of the key words in my understanding uh, to then be, uh, create a discussion about it. So here in this excerpt, we can see that the argument is based on the idea that China is going through a capitalist transformation to accelerate its development through ec economic openness, uh, accepting a subordinate position in the global value chains or the process of globalization because of its cheap, large, well-trained and wealthy workforce. Um, and in this way, uh, understanding the process of globalization being driven by firms and by profit. You can, thank you. Uh, so in my understanding and in our understanding, we uh, the focus of the discussion of, of my part, uh, it's more re uh, related to the domestic um, relations in China. Uh, and then Ahmed is going to talk a bit about uh, the, the, the bigger picture or the international picture. Uh, but then the my questions would be, did China really go through a capitalist transformation? Uh, and I ask this because, well, it's not a consensus within literature or like China what China is. There are several authors talking about uh, state capitalism. There are several authors, such as Norton, for instance, talking about um, market socialism. And there are some authors, like very Marxist, such as Elias Jabur from Brazil, that even would say that China is socialist per se. Um, also, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about uh, this oversimplistic view of Chinese development uh, that doesn't uh, understand uh, the perspective of the state being a central actor in especially conducting industrial policy. And this firm-centric analysis of the international di uh, economic dimensions that also fails to understand the, the role of the, these other players. Please. So, uh, First, uh, before even entering the, the scope of the paper, which was um, the economic opening of 1978, uh, I'd like to talk a bit be, uh, of before the, the economic opening and how industrial policy was, uh, at, right after the, the, the Chinese Revolution, being central and the centrality of both the party, the Chinese Communist Party, and the process of, it, of industrialization and creation of this long-term planning and the five-year plans that are till this day being used to, and very important to allocate like the key uh, important sectors in, in that are pivotal, that were and are being pivotal in this technological upgrading. Moreover, the idea of large scale uh, having uh, industry investment uh, that brought about uh, industrial and manufacturing experience and linkages both up and downstream. And moreover, uh, regarding the Great Leap Forward, we, uh, I wanted to talk about the idea of um, the growth of domestic market in China uh, and this transition from a rural to urban uh, slash industrial society, uh, which of course was a process, didn't happen uh, from one day, but this is central uh, in my analysis, uh, uh, together with uh, this long-term planning and the centrality of the party and the state into understanding Chinese de uh, development pa pa uh, pattern. So yeah, uh, just stating that China uh, entered globalization and uh, not failing this, this connection between entering globalization and uh, indeed uh, being uh, developing its uh, technological cap capabilities or being uh, an industrialized country, uh, fails to understand what were the dynamics of uh, the economic opening and through which, for instance, to have access to the Chinese market, as you, as you said, uh, to, be, to create joint ventures between the Chinese firms, uh, sometimes state-owned enterprises, sometimes just private firms and foreign capital, uh, went through, first of all, conditionalities and monitoring that um, you argue a bit differently than, than me, that there were technological spillovers. Uh, here I'm quoting Medeiros, um, professor from UFRJ in Brazil. And uh, moreover, the literature also talks about um, the gradual, slow, and responsive to the country's needs process of industrialization. Here, bringing Norton and uh, my advisor for my bachelor's thesis, Borghi, uh, with a strong participation of the state and to this long term planning. And the, here, not necessarily in the heavy industries, but more towards industrial diversification and integration. And uh, I couldn't quote uh, even more and more um, in the sense shaping the market, for instance, creating national teams and industrial conglomerates that connect the technological spillovers with the key technological sectors that were, tar were targeted 
uh, in this long-term uh, five-year plans or even um, longer plans, the role of Chinese public banks, the role of infrastructure, the, in this case domestic infrastructure, not necessarily international, because then um, this is a step ahead that we'll see in the next slide. Um, but uh, the, the role of inf the domestic infrastructure, I don't know if you've been to China, but it's crazy. Uh, and also shaping the market. For instance, in the first phase of the, the economic opening, you, you even had like, for instance, a dual pricing system where you had commodities with price, uh, with public and market price uh, to fulfill the needs of um, this uh, long-term planning. Or for instance, exchange rate manipulation, export incentives and tariffs. And now bringing uh, this analysis to a more contemporary analysis. And here, uh, your paper uh, brings a very interesting analysis because indeed, um, there is uh, geopolitical turmoil that is uh, also impacting industrial policy contemporarily. Uh, because, well, like we saw in the three different slides, industrial policy was central, but Norton is even uh, um, arguing that it's becoming even more intensified in this industrial planning and, planning and monitoring and how it's um, linked to the digital revolution and uh, with in, uh, enforcement of RCMs, uh, which are reciprocal contractual mechanisms through KPIs and this consolidation of the innovation driven development. So it's, it's central and it's necessary to understand the role of the state and industrial planning to then understand how China uh, uh, grasp its uh, industrial and technological development. Uh, and also, because you call the Belt and Road, more contemporarily, people are talking about the digital Silk Road. So the digital Silk Road is ba basically a branch of the Belt and Road, uh, which talks about the expansion of ICT investments and uh, that encompass all these uh, characteristics of uh, the digital revolution that is shaping capitalism. Um, and for instance, we can use the case of uh, um, the smart cities uh, produce, uh, that is being done in Malaysia with Alibaba, which is a platform-based firm, Chinese. Um, and in the sense how uh, these are dialectically or like feed feedbacking to each other into this dual, dual movement of digital and non-digital uh, investments. And then in this case, non-digital being infrastructure to then sell the goods of um, technological goods. Well, thank you so much, Enzo, and thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to EPOG. Um, uh, it was very interesting for me going through this paper and especially listening to your um, seminar over here uh, because few of my colleagues and I myself are from a country that is more or less in between uh, this, let's just say, tug of war um, from Pakistan. So it has a lot to do with the Belt and Road Project Initiative, CPAC and everything. So uh, I would definitely agree to a certain extent about um, when you in the paper stated Washington hypocrisy. So I think uh, we uh, from Pakistan, we have a lot to relate to that. Um, so uh, the first point of our discussion that I would like to raise about this paper is like the first one is the oversimplification of uh, globalization. So in the paper, as you stated, China is trying to replace the globalization with a fundamentally Chinese-centric recognition of the world market. So, um, so, uh, so the characterization of the globalization is uh, primarily from a Western perspective of a US-driven uh, capitalist expansion. Whereas um, globalization has a multifaceted nature uh, with diverse actors, nations, and agencies uh, influencing to shape it in what it is today. Also, uh, there's a question of diverse economic uh, models that coexist within the global context. For instance, we can talk about the BRIC nations uh, or BRICS nations because they're increasing. <laughs> and many African nations are developing their own path to globalization that does not necessarily align um, with the US capitalist uh, principles or the Western capitalist principles. Uh, so the discussion is the globalization not a monolithic process, rather a complex interdependency that characterizes uh, the global economy. Also, as noted in the paper that, um, uh, as it is stated over there as well, again, uh, there are alternative approaches and perspective to see globalization that could be from a post-colonial perspective, emerging economies, as I've already mentioned about the break nations and also maybe about um, world system theory. So uh, 
the global so again uh, the discussion i would like to uh, highlight over here is that uh, globalization is not merely one street but involves multiple actors uh, with competing interests strategies and approaches so could you um yeah thank you oh sure also um as it is stated uh, the second discussion point which i my colleagues and i were at a consensus was china uh, was china as a military as a militarizing force um as it stated in the paper it deploys a vast array of seductive instrument and also suggests through the expansion of military capacity uh, that it is in a position to ensure the functioning of this order uh, again the paper portrayal of china as a militarizing force seeking to pimple its order that coercions or again uh, with the present one that is what paper suggests is the us capitalist one um again is a bit one sided argument that uh, i think um a discussion should be or a, the argument should be here that the again the chinese complex uh, foreign policies and its diplomatic uh, or diplomacy is a bit different it's more, more complex um also it argues that the militarization aims at enforcing he hegemonic order or hegemony um yet uh, i think uh, in a broader context if we look at what is happening it's it can be seen in a more of a um, in a regional security dynamics um while uh, again it and one of the examples you've already given in the paper i would like to um, mention it the macron's 400 billion seven year militarization plan and uh, uh, and and you also mentioned like the us bases that are there in the um in the region compared to what you uh, china has already in, in the region so it can be active acted as a like a reactive uh process rather than a um a process of you know more militarizing in a, in, in that way uh on the contrary an article by francois gotman uh basically a report on chinese diplomacy uh that provides a completely different approach to what china is doing uh in terms of its diplomatic approaches um which argues a bit different from what you have stated um i would like to facilitate that um, not facilitate it, highlight that um where we have seen china is trying to be a more of a hegemony or a um, uh, militarizing force uh we have also experienced china as a facilitation of democratic relations or diplomatic relations in context of Saudi Arabia or KSA and Iran and also when um China provided the 12 uh, point proposal aimed at resolving the ongoing Ukraine Ukrainian crisis and beyond middle east we have seen that China has also engaged in mediating efforts in order to regain uh, in regions such as Myanmar and horns of africa um moreover while the paper examined china as a, on a collusion course with western led capitalism um uh we can argue that uh, maybe it's a bit different in the context that uh, the china's diplomatic policies or regional policies that emphasizes as per chinese uh, diplomatic um, how would i say uh, initiatives it's more of a theme of common prosperity and stability which actually led to uh, which actually have resonated with many of the countries seeking alternatives to western led initiative uh, or as you have mentioned in the paper washington hypocrisy and um, and the can you move please thank you and the third discussion points i would like to highlight over here is like the context of infrastructure and uh, hegemony as you have mentioned in the paper uh, china seeks to equate this with the formation of a benevolent international order um the china's assertion that china's infrastructure initiative particularly the belt and road uh, initiative are primarily aimed at asserting hegemony and establishing a chinese centric order presents a narrow perspective that overlooks several critical aspects um china's narrative around the bri emphasizes win win cooperation and uh, i think um from a pakistani perspective or from my country it's more or less uh, inclines toward that because uh, from china as you have already like uh, mentioned in um, in that way uh, we got the belt and road initiative and access to central asia and gwadar and from us we have received uh, the comments of do more i will say um also uh 
So these infrastructures, as you mentioned uh, about the um, like the infrastructure hegemony that in China is trying to create. So these infrastructures surely do not benefit China and the countries that usually aligns with China, but also it includes a wide uh, range of nations across different regions, include Europe, Africa, and Latin America. So uh, the perspective challenge the notion that the BRI is solely about exerting, or these infrastructure is solely about exerting control of establishing a Chinese-centric order. Um, many critiques would argue a bit different, uh, that Western powers have historically used a similar strategy, such as the Marshall Plan, and structural adjustment program to exert influence over other nations. So in this light, I think this is a, one of the discussion points. Um, China's approach can be seen as a counter narrative to Western dom dominance, offering an alternative model of development. Um, can you move please to the next slide? So uh, these were some questions that uh, my colleagues and I had. Uh, the first one being, can the current global system adapt to a multipolar world where China and the U.S. share hegemonic responsibilities, or is conflict inevitable? The second one being, how is the digital revolution shaping the new form of industrial competition? Are developing countries doomed to remain mere recipient of digital investment? I think that's from Enzo. <laughs> and the third one is mine. Um, in what ways do the local political economic and uh, social context of countries involved in the BRA shape the outcome of the infrastructure projects? Are they examples where BRA projects have led to an unintended consequences? So yeah, thank you so much um, for your time and uh, for giving us an opportunity to present. Yeah, please leave the question. Slides, if, if that is okay, yeah, yeah. just a hop from one to another. Yes. So, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes. Uh, Ten mi okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. That was wonderful. I I loved it. Um, so, I mean, the exercise was not easy for you because you only had the introduction to a book. Um, because I was thinking, should I provide a chapter which we, would be more detailed, but would not allow you to get the whole story? And in the end, I decided that I prefer that you get the whole story and that we have a more detailed discussion. This is exactly what you did, so that's, that's great. Um, so where shall I start? Um, I mean, the... A point that was that was that has been mentioned in your different uh, interventions was that there might be oversimplification. I think that's not surprising because it was the introduction to something de more detailed to come. So uh, you you are definitely right, and maybe I just can lift some of your uh, worries of of, of oversimplification. Um, Typically, when it comes to China, indeed, uh, the, the way China liberalized in is, is state-driven, of course, um, and as Nathan Sperber calls it, uh, the, the, the state is the state of the party. So you need also to focus on what happens within the party. Um, and indeed, as you correctly outlined, there were several specific policies that came along with Chinese opening. You mentioned joint ventures, you mentioned the dual price system. Uh, you had different policies where the state was a crucial actor. Um, but still, I mean, I, I, I would very much highlight that um, I do not see a very strict opposition between states and markets. They follow different logics, but they are not fully opposed. And I um, in invite you to, I mean, if, if close office work is not interesting for you, or Fred Block or James O'Connor, um, uh, different authors that very much focus on, on, on the interlinks between the two of them. So you can indeed analytically differentiate different models of capitalism. Nevertheless, the, the common thing is that it is capitalism um, with different actors, but, but still capitalism. I mean, if you look at the dual price system, I think it's a wonderful example of 
showing how the state introduced capitalism in China. Because at the very beginning, before the liberalization, before the late 70s, you had unique prices that were fixed within the frame of a planned economy. And the idea of introducing dual prices was that, on the one hand, the state reduced the official quotas of production. Um, and doing this, it said at the same time, you get the standard price if you fulfill your quota. And we, you might even have higher market prices if you produce more than the quota. So the dual price system was specifically a way of introducing a more capitalist functioning because it made companies and even state-owned companies um, reorganize the functioning in order to have an increasing surplus because this allowed to have higher returns. And higher returns were interesting because at the same time we're introduced, we're authorized, for example, the, was authorized the payment of bonuses. So very uh, heavily in, uh, involved workers could have a bonus, whereas others could be laid off. So you have this dynamic. Um, and it is interesting, you, you mentioned Barry Knott, and, 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 and he specifically emphasizes that, you know, the, 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 the economy grew out of the plan. So it, the, the transformation came from within a planned economy, but moved somewhere very different. So indeed, you have all of these different actors, but for me, it, it, it ends up with the same dynamic, which is um, a, 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 a specifically um, capitalist dynamics, so you can call it state capitalism, okay, I'm fine with that. What, what, what is essential for me is that it is still capitalism. And I mean, if you look, if you look at the debates, I mean, you started in the late 1970s, but if you look Charles Bettelheim's analyses, well, he would say, um, well, it's very nice to have public control of, of, of the economy, but as long as, as it does not benefit workers, um, well, he wouldn't call it socialism. He would call it a type of capitalism. And precisely the Cultural Revolution was, was a struggle between the different fractions within, within the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so there's indeed, um, well, chapter, chapter two, um, which provides um, a, a lot more details about, about that. Um, well, um, since I cannot comment on everything, can the current global system... Well, coming, coming back to the, to the idea of, of hegemony. Mm. Well, I think on the global scale, you can only have one hegemony because hegemony is precisely the ambition to create an order in which everybody feels well. Um, so you have, you have, you can have challenges, count the hegemonic projects, but hegemony as such um, is something unique, at least from a Gramscian perspective. Um, and once you have that in mind, well, this suggests that in the end, having different countries with hegemonic ambitions, um, well, it either ends up with clash or one of, the, one of those countries pretending to hegemony, uh, eventually um, refraining from, 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 from pushing, from pushing the project. So the crucial thing is at this stage, I think that um, the different ways China is trying to shape um, the infrastructures of the global economy are related to the fact that Chinese capitalism became, is, is highly unbalanced and tries to compensate these unbalances through extraversion. And as long as China is following this way, um, I think this, this cannot end up with, um, with just the US saying, okay, we'll leave you some space and, and that's fine for us because precisely the US uh, is relying on, on profits from abroad as well. Um, uh, is it? Yeah, digital transformation. Mm. No, I, I answered the last question first, and I think that, 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 that thereby I'll, I'll come back to the second. Um, 
So um, I, I fully agree with you. Um, I think if, I mean, the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative and all that comes after it and with, within this same frame, um, I mean, it's, it's first and foremost, I mean, the, the, the trigger came from overaccumulation in China. But the very clever thing about it is that Chinese authorities figured out a way of um, allowing a match between their needs and needs uh, that can be found in the rest of the world. Um, so um, precisely when you think of the Belt and Road Initiative as a, an ideological device, um, it's, 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 it's clear that it can only function if to a certain extent it responds to really existing needs. And I think that, at least from, from, a, from, a, from a Marxist ideology perspective, this is crucial. So ideology is not just manipulation of others. It's a smart way of making your needs match with really existing needs of somebody else. Um, and this is precisely what Chinese authorities mentioned to do with the, the BRI. So they actually are actually doing stuff that is useful for many people all over the world. But still, they just um, do not do this because they want to be nice. So they do it because they have their own problem. And so what you see for the time being is, I think, something where you have a coincidence of needs. Um, but still, um, I mean, there's a risk that at some point these needs might diverge. Um, and I do not see. I mean, of course, China and, and, and Chinese fundings represent a lot, an alternative to, to Western fundings. That is, that is true, especially since the conditionalities associated with Chinese fundings are quite different. And maybe, at least in the in the in in in, 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 the, in the in the immediately, maybe maybe even in the longer run. Um, um, ap appear as more benevolent, more, 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 um, more adapted to many underdeveloped countries. Well, at some point, there might be still um, tensions coming up because, um, I mean, so far, that, that's the big question about the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Is China actually willing to get all the money back that they have invested? And that, different signals suggesting that this is not necessarily the case, which from an ideology, ideological perspective is highly interesting because this means that there is also a, a, an, a political ambition there. But still, you need to keep that in mind. Well, you need to keep in mind that there is also this domestic disequilibrium in China that the BRI is trying at least partially respond to. So if there is a lot of loss related to funding, in the Belt and Road initiatives, well, then Chinese authorities need to figure out a way to deal this just in, in simple accounting terms and, 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 and integrate this within their macroeconomic disequilibrium. A way of solving that problem might, might indeed be found in what, what you call the, the, the digital revolution. Um, I like to, th to think in terms of techno-economic paradigms, but what, for example, Lundval and Recap emphasize in, in, in their book, The, the, the digi Digital um, uh, Innovation Race, is that, um, I mean, China is not, not just at the forefront of innovations, uh, but it is also a serious competitor for the race, not only of information and communication technologies, but more specifically, uh, artificial intelligence. And the difference between the past techno-economic paradigms and artificial intelligence is that potentially artificial intelligence is not just a general pur purpose technology, but it might be more than that. It might be a general method of innovation. I mean, I don't know to what extent this is realistic, um, but still, uh, if you picture a situation where you have machines helping you uh, in a very decisive way to innovate, well, then this provides you an even um, 
uh, more serious um, advantage in, in within a given techno-economic paradigm. Um, but still, I mean, I don't have I don't have a real answer for 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 the place where where developing countries fit into this. Um, because, I mean, if you look at how China managed this catch-up, planned policies uh, on a huge scale, well, it's kind of diffi difficult to, to, to do something similar in Europe, even though European countries are quite rich. Um, so from this perspective, I, I don't know how, 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 how other peripheral countries could escape being... being doomed to remain mere recipients of digital investments. Maybe I stop here and we could, if, 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 if you feel frustrated with some of your specific points, then just insist on them. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm there after it. Um, but I, I mean, you brought so much complexity that I couldn't even answer to all of it. And there were, there were many points that I actually share with you and things that appear also in the book. Um, but I think you did a great job. Yeah. Uh, hello, Friederike from Germany. Thanks for the presentation, also the discussion. I learned a lot. Um, I mean, you skipped over the dollar hegemony part, so obviously I have to ask about it. Um, maybe you can summarize what your conclusion is, because we also worked on this a little bit in the first year of the master. Like, is the uh, renminbi internationalization specifically through currency swap lines like a yeah, like a real threat to the dollar and we were kind of concluding that they're also operating in different logics, that the Fed is like just a firefighter in the global financial system versus um, the People People's Bank of China like actively engaging a geopolitical project. So I would be interested to see what your conclusions are about the monetary sphere. Thank you. Are we collecting or? Hi, uh, I'm Isabella and I didn't understand how uh, the U.S. is struggling to generate consent because diplomatically, I'm not sure if it's like dim the diplomacy is a good indicator of that because, I mean, U.S. invaded Iraq and other situations like that. So, uh, and does it also need to continue investing in consent when everyone follows consumption patterns and culture of the U.S. Hello, I'm Aurélien from France. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you to give more details about how um, the um, uh, crisis in the U.S. in the 70s led to the rise of globalization and especially from the... because. We had, like, uh, in the 70s, the slowing down of uh, productivity growth and all that stuff. And I wanted to know if you had some elements on how this impacted, for example, uh, social alliances in the U.S. Uh, between different social groups and how this led to uh, changes in policies in the U.S. that had that impact on globalization. Thanks. Okay. Maybe you can start with this okay. question. And okay. Um, so... Um Now, okay, thank you. Um, so there is a, 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 a much more systematic attempt to actually uh, challenge uh, dollar supremacy. So I think in terms of intent, in terms of purpose, there's something new. Um, then, of course, there is the situation uh, where dollar supremacy is still a fact today. So, I mean, if you look at different indicators, you see a small rise of the renminbi, but still it, it remains quite modest. So, it remains quite modest. That is the second fact. But the, the Chinese authorities are actively trying to change the situations. So, you mentioned swaps, but um, I mean, you, you have different 
different different um, intentions that are related to to the um, to the internationalization of the renminbi. So of course, what is required is that that the renminbi is used in a, to a much more greater extent in different international transactions. Uh, and, 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 and Chinese policymakers are precisely promote, promoting infrastructures that allow to do this. Payment system, messaging system, uh, granting foreigners access to Chinese financial markets. And I mean, if you take only one indicator, you, you know the, um, um, how is it called, the uh, IMF's Financial Market Development Index, something like that. And what is interesting is that when you look at the Chinese trajectory today in terms of financial market liberalization, China is where the US stood in the 1990s. So after 15 to 20 years of liberalization in the US. China is still much less liberal when it comes to financial markets than the US. But if you, if you just look at this indicator, you see a quite steep rise, which of course is related to the fact to attract foreigners to Chinese capital markets, which, which then spreads um, renminbi. So you have different initiatives. And I think, I mean, if you take the overall figures, it doesn't make a big difference. But still, I think what is interesting are the financial sanctions against Russia. Because all of a sudden, um, I mean, um, there's not a lot of macroeconomic data now uh, provided by Russian authorities. But what they provide is the, 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 the currencies in which is invoiced Russian foreign trade. Uh, and what used to be the situation before the, uh, before the invasion of Ukraine was that more than the two thirds were of, of, of Russian for, uh, foreign trade were invested in dollar or in euro. Uh, and this completely switched. Now the two thirds are either in renminbi or in Russian rubble. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the Chinese monetary infrastructures were able to absorb to a great extent an economy of, this, of the size of Russia still tells us that there is quite a lot of capacity. So there is capacity to, to, to bypass, and I think it's, 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 it's quite impressive and probably it, it, it will continue. That, that, that would be my guess. Um, so how is the, um, yeah, the question on US and consent. Well, US policymakers advance something that you said as well which is, well, everybody loves us. Everybody has at least enjoys our values. So therefore, we do not really need, actually, to promote them. Um, Joseph Nye said that. Um, and then, um, I don't know when, a couple of years, he said that in 2003, uh, invasion of Iraq. So don't worry, everybody loves us fundamentally. So we can do what, uh, whatever we want. And then some years later, I think it was like 2018 or so, he realized that actually that it was not true. He, he, he thought, well, maybe actually we are not that welcome in the rest of the world, at least not in many countries. Um, and indeed, you're right, diplomacy is definitely not the only indicator, and maybe, as you said, not the best indicator. Um, Chapter five, chapter 5 in the book provides a lot of different indicators. I, um, among other things, also relied on surveys. And you have actually a lot of surveys. And, uh, and only, on only last week came out the Kex CNC uh, indicator for the Munich Security Conference. And by the way, Pakistan indeed was, is one of the countries that was most critical with, with respect to the, to, the, to the US. There were like 10 countries, and I specifically um, uh, I could identify uh, um, that the situation was particularly a, a, a strong um, in favor of China and Pakistan. So the thing is that you, you have various indicators, and I used many of them. Um, but still, I find it interesting because, I mean, the, the diplomacy issue is interesting with the respect to the fact that through diplomacy or misguided diplomacy, you can actually destroy a lot of consent that you painfully constructed through culture, through education policies. So th the thing is that um, we repeated US invasions of different countries despite international law. Um, well, I think that the US made a mistake because they thought that this would not have negative consequences, but it had. Um, so um, the crisis in the US, 
uh, different social groups. Um, well, I was quite quick on that, and, and maybe that also joins one of your critiques, which, I mean, you said it was oversimplifying a, a globalization, and the, 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 the introduction could definitely provide this, or, or give, 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 give room for, 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 for such an understanding. Therefore, I, I fully understand what you say. Well, the crucial point I'm trying to make is not that the US said we want globalization, and then everybody accepted it. Uh, it was not as simple as that, ob as that obviously. But I mean, the, the, the US had two crucial features through which it acted. First of all, I mean, it prom promoted liberalization, but also through crisis. But the, the crucial thing is rather the, fire fi the firefighting, how to extinguish crisis, and to be able to, 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 to interact and react immediately. So when Mexico is, a, is a, 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 an immense crisis, well, it's on the same night that the US Treasury is calling their colleagues at the Treasury in Mexico. So it's the firefighting process and the coordination process that goes, around, that goes along with it. That is one of the crucial features of the US making of, 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 um, of, of globalization. And the other feature is like this idea of a long-lasting coordination, so this grand strategy issue, which is where do we want to go? So they do not specifically say step by step what everybody should do, but they outline a general framework of where, where they um, should go. And I mean, more specifically, specifically speaking about social alliances, I mean, the interesting thing is, look, you, I mean, if you look at the aggregate figures, that, look at the aggregate figures that we have now, you see an explosion of inequality in the US. And if you look at this in terms of um, social alliances, you might wonder, well, how did many, many people in the US accept this increase in inequality? And I think here is where precisely the, 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 the knot between financialization and globalization comes in. Because this was a quite smart way of matching completely initially completely diverging interests between labor and the transnational fraction of capital. But the thing is, well, if you provide rather cheap consumption goods, then this gives everybody the impression that they can continue consuming. And as a matter of fact, they can. So they can consume new things, and it doesn't um, even come, uh, it's not, not, not really much more expensive. So you have that aspect, which of course is a way of creating consent even within and among the losers of the new uh, social arrangement within the US. And I think this is also one of the, the, the things that allows you to understand why there was, there was a lot of tensions in the US recently, 2022, 2023, waves of strike. Because I think that US transnational capital did not respect its promise that it made within the alliance with uh, US workers. Because one of the major pillars of political stability in the US was precisely that everybody could continue consuming despite being relatively poorer than in the past. And when there is a rise in prices, when there is inflation, then precisely transnational capital is not respecting anymore this, its, its, its share of the bargain. And therefore, I think, I, I mean, I have not studied this in, 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 in a more detailed manner, but I think that U.S. transnational capital made a mistake at, this, at, the, at that point. Um, yeah, Lucien, uh, French and British. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and, and the book in general. Um, I had a question relating to uh, sustainability, especially in, in terms of like transformation and transition, uh, because when you describe this geopolitical and economic conflict uh, over the control over the um, the global market and the associated rise in militarism and, and conflict globally. Um, doesn't that kind of imply that sustainability takes a completely uh, a backseat and that any form of international co cooperation to coordinate um, a sustainable transformation globally ultimately fails? Uh, hello, I'm Zulfia from Azerbaijan. Uh, my question is, maybe I mo missed uh, this point. Um, um, if I missed, I'm sorry in advance, but I was um, trying to understand why um, 
this uh, globalization, like because we talk about globalization in the economic sense, we don't talk about like a cultural or social whatever. So why, uh, when we have uh, like introduced China into capitalism, that is considered uh, hindering globalization? Why, like uh, when there is new power coming in to the like arena of trade? Um, when we were playing like with the rules of the big powers already existed like US and like uh, core countries, it's globalization. But when new power introduced and uh, it tries to play with its own rules, it's considered uh, as hindering globalization. So like I couldn't properly get this point. I, yeah, so that's my question. Uh, yeah, hello, uh, I'm Thomas from Norway. Uh, I have a question about... <coughs> Sorry, um, I'll speak up. Uh, I have a question about the, your explanation of, of uh, the origins of globalization, basically, and the, so like, the change in the dominant social bloc in the US uh, from, uh, from uh, national to, to international capital. Uh, and also like change in the, the basically demand and growth regime, uh, because well, as you explained, with the financialization, uh, demand could be based on 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 uh, debt-based consumption, etc. Um, but yeah, my question is basically: this was a response to the crisis in the 70s in the U.S. But all other, especially at least Western economies, also had to answer to the uh, give answer to this crisis uh, in different ways. Um, and globalization has is not a U.S. phenomenon, as you have already, as you already uh, partially answered the question, I think, because you you said that yeah, the U.S. is not uh, the only country affected by globalization, obviously. But, um, so, do you think something something hap similar happened in the basically in the dominant social blocks in the other countries? Because well, the demand and growth regimes, at least in like a post-Keynesian literature. Uh, you see, can see that there's uh, quite a lot of divert difference, uh, different models in uh, how you arrange, like what what um, demand, like not all have this debt uh, finance model, and uh, I would imagine that there's the the German reaction to the to the crisis in the 70s was quite ri different. But how do you still think that the same forces co caused all Western economies to globalize? Basically, as, as I think that's the the gist of the question, yeah. Hi, <coughs> uh, yeah, I'm Charlie from the United Kingdom. Um, thanks for the presentation and thank you to the uh, commentators too. Um, forgive me, my question's quite abstract. Um, so I'm of the view still that capitalism and globalization are synonymous and that global economic globalization... It, oh, <coughs> sorry, I'll start again. Um, so I'm Charlie from the United Kingdom, um, and yeah, forgive me because my question's like s quite abstract. Um, I'm still of the view that capitalism and globalization are synonymous with one another. Um, so perhaps to open my mind to more to um, this critique of that view, um, how would an alternative economic system uh, support globalization? or in other words, what changes to capitalism would be required so that it doesn't run counter to globalization? Yeah, you did not tell me that no. it was to be that much challenging. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, please. Uh, you, you ah, can I can answer. You, okay. You answer um, first well, okay. With f with respect to well, what prospects? For what? what, what uh, to what extent is um, uh, global cooperations in in terms of sustainability realistic? Um, well, the thing is that what I could identify is that there are ma major drivers that do not tend to fo foster cooperation um, and therefore I tend to be quite pessimistic um, because indeed, yeah, I mean it did not specifically speak about sustainability 
but this has an impact on the prospect of cooperation. And if we are heading towards more conflict, then this conflict is likely to affect different aspects of international relations, among which, of course, the major issue of, of in, in environmental cooperation. So, um, we, well, um, uh, on the current circumstances, I'm not very optimistic. Um, referring to the question about, well, the US is building globalization. China is, uh, is, is said to be hindering it. Um, Well, as I said, the, 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 the definition of globalization that I use is U.S. supervision of the global market. Um, this as, as such, I mean, is not something good or something bad. That's just the, 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 the operational definition that I use. So indeed, um, you, 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 you could think that, I mean, depending on, on what, if you consider that globalization is good or not, hindering globalization is good or not. Um, so, um, well, I mean, in any case, it did not imply, when, when I said hindering uh, globalization, that, that China was per se having a negative impact on the global economy, if that was the, the, the idea behind your question. So, it, it, for me, it's just a, a matter of, of analysis. Um, so, with respect to the, the other Western economies that had to face the same crisis in the 1970s, even though there are different uh, growth models. Well, um, yeah, I cannot fully answer this because I didn't have a look on, 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 on what happened in, in, in other Western countries. But still, what I think is important is that by promoting the opening, I mean, by promoting globalization, even though the US kept the control over the essential infrastructures. Well, the US still came with an offer that might sound interesting also to many different um, firms in Western Europe, for example, or in Japan, which is, well, those of you that are export oriented, those of you that are willing to delocalize part of your production, if you dare to do that, well, we will provide many interesting opportunities to you. And this is, I think, part of the explanation of why uh, in many countries you could find social groups that were very much in favor of what the US was suggesting and were pushing also for that towards their own governments. So this is not a complete um, explanation, but only a, a, a part of it. Um, but still, I think that's, that's, that's worth to be mentioned. Um, well. Another system, uh, what in relation to globalization? Well, um, I don't know about what kind of system you're thinking, um, but I mean, if you, if you think from an environmental perspective, maybe uh, you would favor a slowdown of, of, uh, of certain transactions. Um, therefore, I'm, I mean, if, if you use the uh, definition of globalization that I suggested, well, then this probably would not be globalization, it would be another type of uh, uh, international global uh, economic integration, but it would definitely take a very different shape and, 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 and probably would not be um, under US nor Chinese control. Okay, what are the questions? One, two, three, four, okay, four, and five. Yeah, thank you for the sure. interesting presentation. I found, um, oh yeah, my name is Marino, and I'm from Germany. Um, I found the aspect of complementary accumulation regimes uh, very interesting, that it was first complementary between the US and, and China, and now between China and risingly uh, the, the global south. And I was wondering how this is changing the accumulation regimes within those countries that are engaging with China, what we can already see, and if like this situation um, can be actually used from those countries to shape also a bit like the, the global structure or like their accumulation regimes to have a say in yeah, how this can look like if they can leverage the situation. That's it. Sorry, I didn't see you. I'm Daniela, I'm from El Salvador. Uh, my question was related to this aspect that it's basically the overall title of your book that uh, uh, basically capitalism undermines globalization. 
And you mentioned that uh, the United States has this perspective of using globalization to kind of escape the instability of the system per se. So how, how do you perceive this notion that you mentioned of Harvey of a spatial fix in the Chinese concept? Because is it still capitalism? So what's the notion there? I don't know if it's sort of clear. Hi, uh, I'm Nikhil Rampal. I am from India. Uh, I have uh, one observation that throughout its 60s and 70s following the Cold War, the US was staunchly against communism. So I, I wish to know what exactly seduced, how China seduced the US to fall into the trap of its communist government producing for its country. And second thing is that if that has led to globalization, and now that we are thinking China as a threat, is it is it the globalization that is a threat to capitalism or capitalism is a threat to globalization? How how do we how do we mince our words in that case? Okay. Yes. Okay, here and there. Uh thank you. Uh Jan from Germany. Um I if you, you mentioned um uh, the real estate crisis in the US or the global financial crisis as one of the cracks in the uh, growth model. Uh, there is now a, another crack, but this, this time it's on the Chinese side, also a real estate bubble uh, that had its, um, uh, yeah, the, the most um, uh, consequential episode with the insolvency of Evergrande, the big property investor. And uh, how do you make sense about such uh, crisis in your um, framework? Is it an overaccumulation crisis, and how can China prevent something from uh, like that from happening in China or elsewhere? Okay, it's about to be the end. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Ahmed from Pakistan. So um, uh, I have a question about when you stated like, uh, you know, a uh, single hegemony is inevitable. So my question is, when we talk about hegemony in terms of like regional context, we see like China in Asian regions has its own uh, dominance, but we see India catching up. So in that context, um, do you see like um, collision being inevitable? And also uh, when we talk about um, militarization, as it's a globe it's like more or less a global trend going towards that i'm not sure about it but can we also look at uh, look at as a deterrence of two war like i mean either side would know that they have the masses to harm us and harm one another quite badly so rather than seeing as art as a collision to war can we see it as not a collision to a war as well questions five <laughs> Whew, okay. Um, yeah, transformation of accumulation regimes. I don't know if you were referring actually to the current situation in Germany, if that was something that was on your mind. But I, I mean, it's, I think I find it quite fascinating because indeed, well, the, um, Germany was benefiting a lot um, from, 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 from the opening of China, R last decade sending lots of machines over there. Um, what they seemingly did not see coming is that those machines would actually eventually end up being produced in China and, and, and then it would, well, uh, be a bad hit for, for the G German export uh, sector and I think this is happening r right now, exactly. So I, I think that the, indeed the global economy provides new opportunities also and maybe this might also be an answer, at least partial answer to the, to the question before. So the, gl the global opening um, provides new opportunities for, uh, for, for example, intensifying features of an accumulation re regime that were already there. So I think uh, w what is interesting is to look at accumulation regimes, not only as a purely national dynamic, but to see it in, 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 in constant interaction with, with uh, global opportunities. Um, spatial fix in China. Well, this relates to a certain extent also to the question about the real estate bubble. Um, because what, what China did, I mean, I, I showed you the, 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 the aggregate graph of the in investment rate in China and what, what, what is behind in real terms is, of course, on the one hand, 
um, real estate and on the other side, uh, especially in the most recent years, uh, even, even more um, 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 manufacturing for, for, for exports. Um, I, I do not have a satisfying answer on how China will handle the real estate problems they have actually, but I think there is something very valuable in the presentation made by your fellow students when they emphasize, for example, that the, the banking system is public and that therefore the handling of a crisis would probably not look like what has been done in the US and that there are specific capacities um, to um, limit the damage. Um, nevertheless, if the housing dynamic has come to stop or at least has to slow down, well, it's likely that this means under current circumstances that the extraversion, the spatial fix of the Chinese disequilibria will even become stronger in, in, in the future. I mean, there's nowadays uh, talk uh, within the CCP about qualitative growth, promoting consumption, but actually this is, I mean, when I did the research for the book, this same story happens. I mean, ha has been told many, many years again and again, like since the 1990s. So I don't believe it anymore when they say that they will shift towards consumption. I wait to see it. Uh, but so far, I could not see it. And also for good reasons, because if you do this, this might open up a lot of social conflicts within China. I don't go into the details because I only have one minute to answer this, but, but you find answers in the book. Um, <laughs> So how, how did the Chinese communists lure in the foreign capitalists? A, a fantastic question. Um, and there's a super answer in Arigi's book, um, um, Adam Smith in Beijing, when, when he says, well, look at the 80s. There was opening in China. But who were the first foreign capitalists invent, investing in China? Well, this, those were the, the diaspora Chinese from Singapore, from Hong Kong. I mean, they, they had, of course, um, cultural advantages, linguistic, understanding how the Chinese society works, at least to a better extent than German or French or US capitalists. So they were the first. And then the, the, the capitalists in the US in the very, very early 90s said, oh, I think we are late to that party. There's something really crazy going on. I mean, they call themselves communists, but they do whatever we want. They even allow now repatriation of profits. And they even allow us not only to produce in special economic zones, but even to um, sell things to the huge consumer market. So at some point, Western capitalists realized that what, what they considered risky, namely diaspora Chinese investing in China, well, actually was not very risky, but was highly profitable. So you indeed have this cultural element there. But um, uh, in, in any case, given, and then, I mean, there were lots of reforms also, there has been a constitutional, uh, first a new competition law in 1993 in China, then a constitutional reform that guarantees the private property of the means of production. So China provided lots of guarantees also within that period. So you had the opportunity for a lot of profits and you had legal guarantees, and I think that was enough. Um, and then, I mean, you have an additional aspect which you need to keep in mind when you think in terms of global value chains. It's not only that lead firms get rid of part of the investment, but they also get rid of part of the risk. So indeed, maybe if the Chinese authorities decide to nationalize the whole manufacturing sector, that would be an inconvenient for lead firms because they might lose suppliers, but still they do not lose their investment. So I think it is also much easier to spread internationally when the global economy is organized in terms of global value chains. Um, Regional hegemony, collusion, inevitable. Um, well, the thing is, indeed, you could think that it, if there is an arms race and everybody is too strong and nobody is willing to take the risk of, have, of having uh, major damage. That's true. That's true. But the thing is that it does not really give you, I mean, you do not have increasing military spending. You have real inf impact. I mean, you have French warships going to the um, Taiwan Strait. Uh, you have even Ch uh, Germans now going there. And you have, I mean, you saw all the military bases, lots of um, US warships. And there is this ongoing conflict between the Chinese Navy and the Philippine uh, Navy. And all of this seems to be in intensifying. And within 
disintensification, also accidents might happen. And those accidents might be then the triggering point. So I do not have a definite answer. But what I refer to in the book um, are studies um, funded by the US Army, uh, highlighting that the likeliness of conflict increases wherever the US Army is heavily present. So having an army somewhere is rather likely to generate conflict. So that's also, I mean, it does not predict conflict, but you, know, you can think in terms of likeliness and in terms of factors that create more or less tension. I think that the dynamic we see here does not create less tension.